Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to another Word of God. Average folks in the afterlife, I believe number 91. And we're continuing on with our discussion of uh, Frederick Sculthorpe's Excursions to the Spirit World. His uh, record of uh, many years uh, OBE uh, excursions from his uh, either his armchair or his bed most of the time. And uh, this may be the last one. We seem to be getting toward the end. But um, we'll see. I do have a tendency to rattle on, so um, perhaps uh, <laughs> it'll go on farther than I think it does. <clears throat> one of the many things that surprised me when I began to have sittings with experienced mediums was the number of times I was told that my spirit teachers had been with me from birth and had guided my footsteps through life. They certainly knew all about me, and now my daughter in spirit tells me the same thing. The many incidents in life, especially during war service, which at the time I attributed to luck or narrow escape, later made a pattern that I had overlooked until it was brought to my notice. A month after the 1914 war started, I enlisted at the age of 17. Some said it was foolish, but this early enlistment caused me to visit countries I would not have seen otherwise. First I visited the Aegean and the Greek Isles, then Upper Egypt and lastly the Holy Land. Prior to going overseas, I joined the machine gun section of my unit and with pitying looks was told by my companions that I had joined the suicide club. We landed on Gallipoli beaches, and it was rather significant that owing to casualties in our first advance, I was at once promoted to, from reserve machine gunner to full membership with all the amenities. However, after that, and throughout the war, no one who was in my gun team at the time was a casualty by enemy action. Now recalling incidents that occurred during four years of war, there seemed to be some helpful influence at work. My first narrow escape was on the beach at Gallipoli. We had been relieved from the front line and I was sitting talking with three companions near the water. A strange officer came up and tapped me on the shoulder and said that he wanted me to unload some officer kits from a lighter. I was very annoyed as I was tired, but I had to go. When I got back, I found that a shell had landed in the middle of my three companions and all were killed. Later, my gun was in position in a short front trench on Hill 60. I do not know why the colonel suddenly decided to have it put in the second line of trenches, but the next day the ground shook and we saw our former trench forming a high curtain of earth and dust in the air. It had been mined and there were no survivors. Is he protected? And why is he protected? Perhaps we'll see. Many times my careless moments seemed to be watched. Once on a small outpost in the Sinai Desert, after being relieved from outlook at midnight, I strolled into our small rush hut where we had our meals. The desert there can be cold at night in the winter, and I was looking for something to eat before turning in. There was a wine bottle on a shelf, and I smelt it and was lifting it to have a drink of what I thought was rum, when a kind of dread entered my mind and stopped me. I walked to the door of the hut and in the moonlight poured some of the liquor into the palm of my hand. It looked rather dark and I rubbed my palms together to warm the fluid and smelt again. It was iodine. The cold had deadened my sense of smell and I only caught the spiritous tang of iodine. Later, after a bout of jaundice, I was sent to convalesce at a small palace near Cairo. There was a boat for our use in one day, landing with a companion after a strenuous row, row against the Nile current. It was rather strange that we should be told that the doctor had unexpectedly called and was impatiently waiting to see us. Running upstairs to see him, he told me that my heart needed rest and further convalescence at Luxor. Luxor is in the upper Nile, about 400 miles from Cairo, and I was told it was a haven for pampered troops. It was, all of this, and rather more to me, as it had the world's largest collection of ancient temples and tombs, as uh, I'm sure some of you know. From my room in the Winter Palace Hotel facing the Nile, I could see beyond the river the Colossi, and more distant in a shimmering haze, 
the hills with the temples cut into the rock face. I went to the temples and tombs of Luxor, Karnak, and Thebes, and was impressed by this ancient civilization and their strange beliefs and inscriptions. I thought that I would have to miss Thebes and the tombs of the queens. It is seven miles by donkey, and a new con as a new convalescent, I was barred from such a journey. However, a friend whispered that when the party assembled for the ferry, someone would not answer to his name, and that somebody else would answer in his place, and it would be worth seeing, so I took the hint. During the course of the war, my unit gradually advanced through Sinai and then into Palestine, and the names of places that once fell on inattentive ears during scripture lessons at school brought a new interest. At one time we had our gun beneath the wall of Saladin's castle on the hill at Maj Majdal Yaba. From the battlements we could see across the plain another castle, said to have been built by Richard the Crusader. Once when bathing at Gatha, I was carried out to sea by a strong current. I tried my fastest stroke but made no headway. There were no boats as it was the seaward flank of two armies and within sight of the enemy. There was nothing I could do about it, so I floated and rested. I was surprised at my own calmness during the situation. When I was cons a considerable distance out, I found that I was free of the current and could make headway parallel with the shore. I then swam in a long slant and landed farther down the coast behind our lines. Once when out of the front line and sitting in my bivouac, I was interested in some long columns of troops going by. During one of the infrequent halts, I thought I would go and speak to some of them. I found that they were divisional troops from India. I had an acquaintance in a regiment that had gone to India, and when I made inquiries, I found him standing a dozen yards away. Quite a coincidence, I thought, especially as his division and its various units and transport stretched for 15 miles. That's a big division. On another occasion in Alexandria, my attention was seemed drawn to a soldier who had his back to me. When I walked round and saw his face, I found that it was my cousin. Now, is that hints from spirit guides or his own intuition? I'm not sure if he knows. And... I'd say it's debatable. It could be either, or both. My travels in Egypt and Palestine gave me much food for thought in later years when studying different religions and psychic science. The immense and impressive masonry of the self-styled mighty rulers of Upper Egypt and all the realms, etc., contrasted strangely to the country of the man who left nothing and whose kingdom was not of this world. I am not a religionist and have never voluntarily attended an Orthodox church service, so my study of different beliefs was in the nature of a sincere quest for truth. I was sitting at my desk in my shop parlour and keeping an eye on my shop when I sensed a spirit presence. I knew the feeling as I had it many times before, but this was different. Instead of being confined to the head and mentality, it gradually enveloped my whole body. It seemed as if a ray or power held me to the chair with a fullness of heart, as if all the more tender moments in my life had been gathered together. And I heard a voice say, Whom do men say that I am? Then tremendously, vividly, and in a matter-of-fact way, it was impressed upon my mentality that Jesus was in charge of the world. Oh my. I was uplifted and seemed to know everything. There was no need to think. My thinking was done for me. I was not conscious of my chair and was comfortable and contented in something that surrounded me. No need to bother about my shop. I knew there would be no interruption. I wanted the spiritual power to stay, but gradually it withdrew, and I mentally sent a simple thought of thanks and blessing. As I sat at my untidy desk, which for a while had become a sanctuary, I felt excited over the import of this experience and the wisdom in which such a great deal had been explained in such a simple way. The words quoted in the style of James the First period was simply to draw my attention to the circumstances connected with their appearance in the Bible. The second part of the message, quote, in charge of the world, end quote, was a simple modern thought and given for me a sincere seeker. There was no vague theological mistiness about it, and it simply meant just what was given. I got up from my chair and went to the shop floor. It was a sunny afternoon and shoppers were passing. Yet, as I expected, no customer had entered to interrupt my communion. I wondered what my teacher and guide, the Chinaman, thought of the teaching of the Nazarene, 
as I do not suppose he had heard much about it when on earth. About a year answer, I, about a year later, I got an answer in a strange way. I was one of a group attending a demonstration of psychic painting done while the medium is in, controlled by a spirit artist. As she finished a painting for me, which is a portrait of a Chinaman, she said, this is a guide and I am impressed to do this. She painted a cross in the corner of the picture. During the early part of the Second World War, my projections continued for a while, and then I had my second most outstanding experience out of the body. Projected during the night, I was taken to a group of young British soldiers who had just passed over. As is often the case with young and healthy people whose passing was not preceded by a long, weakening illness, they had become conscious almost at once. They were standing in a bewildered group just staring around. Some were looking at their equipment, which was in pieces and scattered about, and they seemed to recollect that they had some connection with it. But the spirit mind was too shocked at this stage to bring understanding. One young soldier nearest to me was staring at the kit at his feet. The belt, shoulder straps and valise were separated as they had not altered much since the First World War. I said to him, let me help you. I was a soldier. As I was kneeling and buckling the parts together, I happened to look towards the group and was surprised to see a figure standing in their midst who was head and shoulders taller than the rest. I knew it was Jesus, and although he was unlike any of the earthly pictures I know of him, I just knew. To my surprise, they took no notice of him. He was looking at me, and I felt uncouth as I realized I was staring intently, but I thought that he would not mind that I must see him. His gaze was steady and serious, and he said, I have been with them all the time. I thought I ought to have known that and realized how puny my own efforts were to help. There was a pause as I continued to stare and then I began to be drawn away. I wanted to stay a little longer, but this earnest desire had no effect. I kept my consciousness on my journey back to my physical body and then halted and paused impatiently to reanimate it. I did not passively wait to see any spiritual symbol on the ceiling. I had got my treasure and as soon as I was able to move, I stretched my arm and found the light switch. Somehow I felt that I wanted to fully contemplate with my physical mind and then share it with all. However, I'm afraid that sharing with all was at the time whittled down to telling a few of my intimates who had spiritual experiences and might understand. Since this experience, I've had a, seen a photographic reproduction of a painting, which I thought was a good likeness of Jesus as I saw him. It is by a Swedish lady, Bertha Valerius, and it was executed with spiritual guidance and inspiration. It was finished by the end of the last century, and I understand the original is in a private chapel in Stockholm. Many paintings of Jesus show him as having dark hair. To me, his hair and beard appeared to be mid-brown, the beard being slight. I did not notice the colour of his eyes. He was wearing a white gown, like many of the Arabs and Egyptians I saw during my war service. I am very thankful for what has been given me and the doors that have opened in my simple seeking for truth. I liken my progress of spiritual knowledge to swimming in an ocean. I believe that I have now made a start and have wetted my toes on the edge of that ocean. Epilogue. I once saw the robe figure of an advanced spirit in a lower plane. The robe was not a spirit robe, but had assumed his earthly appearance and clothing while teaching in this lower state. He had a small group of modern spirits around him who sensed he was different from themselves, and one of them who was curious about this said, You were born before our time, weren't you, old man? He replied, I was born before the pharaohs. Now that is the end of the text as given. And um, there is a essay an appendix requested by the author from the then prominent researcher, Dr. Carl E. Mueller, where he compares uh, Frederick's experiences to, you know, many others. And, um, you know, for example, Uh, 
being a researcher, he is aware of uh, many other uh, cases in the literature and picks out a few that uh, seem to be uh, useful comparisons. And here's a, a segment called A Parallel to Mr. Sculthorpe's Case. For several years, Mrs. Yu, whom I have known a long time, and has had many interesting projections. These were a consequence of her undertaking meditation exercises very earnestly. Thus her projections are a result of her spiritual development and her case may be likened to that of Yiram as well as to that of Mr. Sculthorpe. Yiram, that's another uh, out-of-body projector, it's a, a pseudonym, pen name. And it's a fairly famous book that I think I have downstairs. We might make a comparison on another uh, reading. That and, you know, Oliver Fox and a couple of others. When her first exteriorization occurred, she was lifted out of and above her material body by spirit helpers, whom she saw clairvoyantly. This experience was rather painful to her and therefore did not last long. Subsequent projections were not painful anymore. As a rule, she leaves her body sideways without perceiving outside help. When returning, she is usually conscious of re-entering her body again, but when projecting, she often finds herself outside her body without having observed the process of separation. Now, I must say in my early days of using my note tapes and, and whatnot, um, and trying to catch the part of me, because I knew it would be a part that was exiting, um, I very rarely could catch it. It would hide and then whip out. <laughs> it was all, all seemed to be teasing me, just like my guides. And um, a lot of this is covered in uh, More Adventures in Eternity, um, my second book. Um, but just to uh, make a quick comparison, um, it seemed, after a while I just gave up. I couldn't seem to really catch it. I couldn't get the vibrations. I couldn't... Um, the odd time I could, but not very often. And I just seemed to be, you know, having these wild experiences that I'd remember later. Um, so, yes, not for Gordon, that one, but for others, of course. Although she could not see her physical body lying in bed, and she did not see the silver gourd connecting her subtle body with the material body. After discussing this with me, she asked her spirit helpers to show her the cord, and one night she was led into a neighbouring flat where three people lived. Their doubles were standing in their bedrooms, and she could see their cords connecting them with their material bodies. Among other details, she noticed the colouring of the cord to be different with each person. Isn't that interesting? Um, there's a lot of testimony about the cords and the way they look or vibrate. Sometimes you get this, this energy sort of ripple running down them um, in some descriptions. Sometimes they're silvery, sometimes they're gold, sometimes they're just sort of vague, smoky things. Um, and then many people say they don't see them at all. I, to, me it's, to me, it's like the radio receiver um, analogy that's often used. You tune your radio receiver and you get another one station and you get another. Some stations are weak, some stations are strong, depending on their signal. And if you kind of use, you know, it's non-digital and it's on a, a dial, you get between stations and you just get static. You don't get anything. Well, maybe static says something. But um, that's the analogy I use. Um, there are many vibrations in the universe, vibratory signatures. We all have them as individuals, of course. And so do spirits, and so do spirit guides, and yada, yada, yada. And it just depends how finely you want to tune in to any one vibrational level. Sometimes you get on the edge of it, and it's a little, you know, fuzzy, and sometimes you whammo, you're right in the middle, and you get the full, you know, the full Monty. Um, but to me, it's not really that important a point. The, bit, the important thing is to understand the principle of vibration and the principle of um, many, 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 many vibrations and one's ability as a perceiving entity um, with perceptual mechanisms that are built into your consciousness and your body and your mind and your nervous system. 
that you can tune into these if you wish, but you don't really have to. Am I making sense here? I think that's about it. It's, it's too easy to get caught up in the um, what seems to be the rules and regulations of the old occult books or the old spiritualist books and then think that the modern ones are are better or smarter or, you know, less ideological or, you know, not so old-fashioned. But they all have their cultural set and their assumptions, unspoken assumptions. And uh, I would say beware of all of them. Absorb the knowledge that they seem to be giving you and uh, play with it and let it serve your purpose and your journey because they're all different. I, I had to do this. I studied all this stuff, read it, going right back to the 70s, even before I started to experience stuff, I was reading this stuff. And um, I had to work my way through. Spiritualism teaches you some stuff. Theosophy teaches you other things. Occultism teaches you other things. Um, general psychic science teaches you other stuff. You just sort of blend it all together and bring it into your own journey and use what you need to use. And it'll be different from what I needed to use, that's for sure. Among other details, she noticed the colouring of the card to be different with each person. Good point. And something you don't see that often. After I'd met Mr. Sculthorpe, we discussed the possibility of experiments, and I suggested he should meet Mrs. Yu while both were in the projected state. When consulting spirit friends through a medium were told that this was not as easy as might appear because conditions had to be right and vibrations would have to be equalized. Therefore, the only result of this idea was the following incident. On October 14, 1957, Mr. Sculthorpe wrote in a letter from London, Quote, I have made a note of the following experience in case it might have been an experiment by our spirit friends, and the lady may have been Mrs. Yu. Unfortunately, I was not fully conscious of the state and therefore did not particularly note the person's features. 15 September, Sunday afternoon, 3.15 p.m., I was projected and found myself in a room watching a lady who appeared to be walking up and down and rehearsing the lines of a play. Another lady was sitting at a table reading the script and answering at times. End quote. It apparently was an experiment. Mrs. Yu confirmed that at that date, at the time mentioned, she had been sitting in Zurich, Switzerland, at a table with a book on Buddha, discussing some details with a lady friend who has the habit of pacing up and down a room when discussing something. Though there was no rehearsing of a play, the scene was correctly observed. Um, good point, and I know a lot of you uh, are having meeting up experiences that are, you know, similar to that. And I think uh, if you're doing it to try and prove something to yourself, you could be disappointed. And I think the reason is that, as he says here, when consulting spirit friends through a medium, we were told that this was not as easy as it might appear because conditions have to be right and vibrations would have to be equalized. So that's the personal vibration of the two people having to meet, have to be equalized. Now, how you go about doing that before you do your uh, rearranged projection to meet is up to you. But I would suggest you focus on that aspect of it. Synchronize your vibrations. You're in, obviously, you're going to synchronize your intentions, but try to your personal vibrations. And I'm not even sure that would be that simple. Um, because everyone has a different vibration depending on their uh, past life, you know, in this incarnation and how you've evolved and how you've developed and what interests you and what excites you and what depresses you, all that sort of a thing is factored in. And um, although I wish you luck, great luck in these experiments, I would urge you not to be too disappointed if they don't pan out. It's not that important. During her excursions, Mrs. Yu has never been exposed to direct attacks by ill-intentioned spirits. But when returning from projection, she has more than once found her material body occupied by another spirit. Now, this is interesting. I very rarely hear of this. 
She then entered the body from one side and the intruder had to leave by the other side. No disagreeable after effects were experienced. I wish to emphasize my firm conviction that a projectionist is no more in danger of an obsession than anyone else. Um, I would agree with that. And I'm interesting to even hear of it because when uh, that's one thing that uh, people fear when they're starting out is that some other spirit's going to move in, if temporarily. And then people are usually told, oh, don't worry about it, it's not going to happen. And that would be my experience if you've got guides protecting you. If your guide knows that you're experimenting with this, they'll set up a protection. But you can also set up that protection yourself before you, you know, move on out. You know, do a sort of a white light protection ritual. It's simple enough. And uh, low uh, vibration spirits will, will not be able to get through it or they'll, they'll, they'll be so upset at the white light that they won't even try. While on an excursion, Mrs. Yu felt the pull of the cord. She also felt, without seeing anything, the presence of a spirit helper who gave her power at times when she felt like fainting. When projected into the spirit world, she has seen spirits and spoken to them, some of them unknown and some of them known, and, as, and mostly friends and relatives who had quote-unquote died. In the projected state, she's able to pass through walls and close doors, but at first she felt a slight resistance when doing so. Another interesting experience she had. While walking on the pavement of a busy street, she suddenly lost consciousness, and on coming to herself again, she found that she had continued to walk for at least 25 yards while unconscious. Two years later, walking along the same stretch, she felt a peculiar sensation on the same spot, but pulled herself together. In her opinion, if she'd let herself go, the same experience would have happened again. That's um, 25 yards of unconsciousness. Reminds me of people say, when you're just chatting with friends and acquaintances, people will talk about how they have a moments of seeming unconsciousness when they're driving. I don't mean they pass out, but they sort of go, there was a whole three or four minutes where I, I don't remember, you know, I think automatic pilot, but you, you know, you drift off into, um, you know, some sort of uh, thought pa pattern and, or fantasy or whatever, and then you come back. So, I mean, again, it's the same things that happen whether you're in body or out of it, many, many similar uh, psychological events and processes. I've mentioned the above because such occurrences do not seem to be rare. Two score other correspondents have made similar statements. Also a personal acquaintance, Mrs. P, some years ago, on two occasions whilst walking on the street, felt herself outside her body and saw it walking at her side. This experience lasted uh, for some 20 yards. I think the, in the old literature they used to call this the uh, projection of the etheric double. Seeing your double, yeah. Being afraid of becoming insane, she made an effort of will against it happening again. And, and at that time, of course, she had no knowledge of psychic facts. I have come into contact with a number of people having out-of-body experiences in a variety of forms, up to fully-fledged projections. All my acquaintances are sound and sane persons, some also knowing the difference between clairvoyance and projection. And these occurrences cannot be explained otherwise than by assuming a subtle body capable of separating from the material body in varying degrees. Experiences of exteriorization have been never been proved to be a sign of insanity. But individuals having repeated spontaneous experiences of projection should have access to knowledge and the advice of trustworthy persons having studied in the field. Then he gives some uh, historical examples and talks about bilocation and trilocation. And there's quite a lot here. including one from Paramahansa Yogananda in his famous book, Autobiography of a Yogi. If we turn to that modern book, we find but one example of a projection. A yogi, while sitting in meditation, projects his double and appears to a friend in the street and gives him a message, the friend thanking, thinking him materially present and hearing his voice. But even here, the material body was not active. Still, if correctly reported as a successful, willful projection of the evidential kind. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, there are uh, many other uh, historical examples here. Um, I don't know if it's worth going into them particularly. Um, all interesting, and you can find them in, in other books, other uh, collections of uh, projection uh, experiences, exteriorization experiences. I think I've got an old uh, theosophical book by uh, Ledbetter, which got dozens of them, which I may have read from some time ago. Now, there is um, a sequel to this book, which I now can't seem to see. I've got it somewhere. And uh, as I recall, it's not quite as interesting as one would have hoped. It's a sequel uh, published in uh, 1975. And uh, instead of, there's a few new experiences, but mostly he goes over the older experiences in, in greater detail, in greater sort of philosophical, analytical sort of ways. And um, I will have another look at it again. And if there's uh, something of great interest, I will, I will uh, read from it next time. Meanwhile, I have a, a channeled book from 1975 by a Lutheran theologian called Matson, which I saw a reference to in another book. And uh, there's some very interesting stuff in there, perhaps more of interest to uh, those of you who feel uh, how interesting it would be to see how convinced and uh, how shall we say, faithful Christians experience the afterlife. And um, I will be pondering that one over the next couple of days and uh, uh, get to that very soon. And um, in the interim, I shall uh, wish you all well and good luck with all those uh, astral journeys. And even if you don't remember them, know that you are having them. I've visited a number of you at, at night, and I know you're having them. I see your bodies on beds, and, um, you know, I just sort of glimpse them. I don't hang around and get all nosy. Um, and you're gone. You know, you're, you're gone, and the spirit's gone. So, you know, and sometimes I track you, and sometimes I see you. But um, you're all doing just fine. Even if you can't bring it to consciousness right now, or only partial consciousness, or only shades of partial consciousness, understand that you will bring it, bring it to greater and greater consciousness as your desire to do so slowly unfolds from its doubts and its fears, I, including the usual one of, uh, will my family think I'm nuts? Will my co-workers think I'm crazy? Will my kids laugh at me? Will, you know... Uncle Ted not make fun of me at Christmas next year. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, once that unfolds, and not to mention your own fear of your own sanity, like can you cope from day to day while doing all this? Well, I'm living proof that you can. I mean, it does get a little weird sometimes, but, you know, you can handle it. It's not that weird. There's other things in life that can be just as challenging as going out of body and remembering the next morning at uh, 10 o'clock while you're having a coffee and reading the Globe and Mail. Um... Believe me, there are. Um, so uh, understand that this will happen. Be patient with yourselves. Be kind to yourselves. And enjoy each moment as it comes. I mean, seriously. Really do. And um, until next time, friends, so long.